the name of him who is and who was and who is to come, amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, who is the bread of life, come down from heaven. My guess is that Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 is one of the most well-known miracles of Christ. With the exception of the resurrection, it is the only miracle that Jesus did that is recorded by all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's how important the evangelists thought this particular miracle was. The early church was fascinated by it too. Some of the oldest Christian artwork that we have discovered is prominently displayed by fishes and loaves. And my guess is you first learned the story of Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000 when you were very small in Sunday school. A story that reminds you that Jesus provides all your needs. Now, there is a sense in which all of Jesus' miracles, any of Jesus' miracles, teach one important truth. That truth is that this Jesus is more than meets the eye. That while he is true man, he is not just true man, he is also true God. So whenever we see Jesus do a miracle, whether it's giving sight to the blind or healing the lame or the leprous or raising someone from the dead, every single one of those miracles is intended to point us to the truth that Jesus is the powerful Son of God. But you know, just like every miracle of Jesus has something in common, so too there is something unique about each of Jesus' miracles. What is it that God is trying to teach us about our Savior? What is it that he's trying to teach us about his care for us that is uniquely taught by this miraculous feeding of 5,000? Well, that's the question we are going to explore as we go through this very familiar miracle account. And what we'll see is that what makes this miracle unique, what what sets it apart from all the other miracles of Jesus, is that it reminds us that Jesus provides for all our needs. Not only does it tell us that he will do that, it also tells us why. This story is a reminder that Jesus meets all our needs only because of his compassionate love. And it teaches us how he provides for all our needs through his almighty power. Now, you'll notice these words from Matthew 14 begin, when Jesus heard what had happened. Well, what is it that had happened? Well, earlier in the the chapter, we learned that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Remember John? John was Jesus' cousin. And he was the great forerunner of the Messiah. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, we hear John on the banks of the Jordan River proclaiming law and gospel. We hear John confronting the Pharisees. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? We hear him proclaiming that the axe is already at the root of the tree and that when Messiah comes, he will burn all the stubble, all those who oppose him. Well, John directed that very same law preaching against King Herod and his incestuous and adulterous relationship, and that got him thrown in prison. And you probably remember the story of Salome's daughter and how John the Baptist was ultimately beheaded. Well, news that the great forerunner, his cousin, had just reached Jesus, that that he had died. And so we read that when he heard this, Jesus withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. 
Jesus had been on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, teaching in the very highly populated parts of Galilee. But he and his disciples, when they heard that John had died, sailed to the eastern shore, which is much, much less populated, uh, an area that the Bible says is remote. There's just nothing out there. Why would Jesus do that? Well, Jesus is understandably sad because the greatest man born of woman has been put to death. He had a personal relationship with John. He was related to him. And more importantly, John was the great forerunner announcing his arrival. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is a true man. And just like we see when Lazarus dies, Jesus is sad when he hears that John the Baptist has been put to death. Jesus needs to retreat from his very public persona and spend some time alone with his disciples trying to process the death of his cousin. And so they push off the banks of the Sea of Galilee, probably taking their sweet time. Remember, it's supposed to be a relaxing trip from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other. But if you know anything about geography, then you know that the Sea of Galilee isn't that big. And so it would have been very obvious to people on the western shore when they saw the direction that Jesus' boat was heading to figure out where they're going to land right over there. And so they went around the Sea of Galilee by foot. And when Jesus and his disciples arrive on the eastern shore, there's a huge crowd there. How big? Well, later we're going to learn that Jesus fed 5,000 men. And that's not even including the women and the children. How many people were there? 7,000, 8,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. This is the crowd that Jesus meets as he lands for this little sabbatical, this little day off that he plans on taking to to grieve and mourn over the death of John. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have blamed Jesus a bit if he had gotten off that boat and said, Sorry, people, I'm not in today. Today is my day off. Today is the day that I'm setting aside for myself and for my disciples. You'll all just have to come back tomorrow. But that isn't what Jesus does, is it? Matthew specifically tells us that when Jesus lands on the eastern shore and he sees this large crowd, he has compassion on them and he heals their sick. Isn't this such a beautiful description of who Jesus is and what Jesus does? He always goes out of his way. He always inconveniences himself for the sake of others. He left the glory and splendor of his heavenly home to come to this earth and live a life in this broken world, experiencing all the hardships and heartaches that we do so that he might live a perfect life under the law in our place. Even though he was without sin in every way, perfect obedience to all of God's commands, he willingly and even joyfully took upon himself the sins of the entire world, your sins and mine, was nailed to a cross on Calvary to offer a payment for them all. This is the heart of God that is on display, the heart of Jesus that is on display for you and for me. We are not an inconvenience to Jesus. When he sees us, he does not think, oh, just come back tomorrow and I'll take care of your heartaches. No, even today, Jesus looks at us and he has compassion. But I think the real interesting part of this account is the conversation that happens between Jesus and his disciples. Now remember I mentioned that this account, this miracle account, is recorded in all four Gospels. 
It's interesting to know because while Matthew only tells us that Jesus healed their sick, we learn in Mark and Luke that Jesus spent the rest of the day preaching to those big crowds, that he shared with them the truths of the kingdom of heaven. And as the day began to wear on and as evening drew closer and closer, those disciples began to feel a little hungry. It was supper time, and Jesus didn't show any sign of stopping. If they had been wearing watches, they would have been looking at them as Jesus kept preaching, saying, how long does he plan to go for? And eventually, they become so impatient that they actually stop Jesus preaching to make sure he's aware of the hour. Matthew says, as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. The disciples see a problem. Remember, they're in a remote place. There there is no grocery store. There is no fast food restaurant around that can feed 10, 7, 7, 10, 15,000 people. The disciples say, Jesus, you've got to dismiss these people. You've got to let them go so that they have time to go to the villages and towns all around here and find some food to eat. Sounds reasonable enough, doesn't it? But what does Jesus say in return? Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. This is really interesting, isn't it? It's a command in Greek, you give them something to eat, and the word you is emphasized. Jesus is saying, no, they don't need to go to the towns and villages. You guys, you 12, you're going to be the ones that are going to give them something to eat. The disciples look at each other, and they think, Jesus, you lost your mind? We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Now, when you hear loaves of bread, don't think the kind of foot-long loaves that come in a bag that we buy at the grocery store. A loaf of bread was what we might call a bun or a roll, probably a flat bread. And five of them constituted what we might call an adult-sized meal. And fish, don't think about it like a 15 or 20-pound trout or grouper or something like that. It's dried fish, strips of dried fish that could be put in a a, a patch, a a, a satchel or something and carried on on a day trip. The disciples look at the food that they have and they say, Jesus, we have enough to feed one person, not 10 or 15,000 people. In fact, we read in another gospel that one of the disciples says, Lord, even eight months' wages couldn't feed so many. Well, what's going on here? We have an example of Jesus' disciples looking at what God demands, looking at his command to feed 10 or 15,000 people and focusing on what they have, five little rolls of bread and a couple of dried fish, And them saying to Jesus, what you ask is impossible. We cannot do what you tell us to do with the little bit that we have. And brothers and sisters, isn't that your and I's attitude so often as well? We look at what our Lord has graciously given us. Even though we are the wealthiest country, not just on the earth today, but on the earth ever. And we look at our bills and our responsibilities. We look at the the things that we are to do and the things we want to do. We look at what we have. and We look at where we want to go and we say, Lord, that's impossible. Lord, you ask the impossible. Friends, what's really going on when we do that is we are breaking the first commandment. Remember the first commandment? Love the Lord your God above all things. Love, trust in God above all things. 
when we question God, when we call his goodness into question, when we wonder, when we doubt that he is going to provide for all our needs, we are in essence telling him that we do not trust him to provide. And when the disciples said, all we have here are five loaves and two small fish, Jesus, they were committing the same sins of doubt as well. So what does Jesus do? Bring them to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Doesn't look like a miracle. What would have been much more impressive is if Jesus had put the the loaves and the fish on the ground and said some kind of magical incantation and have them grow to be the size of massive pumpkins. But that's not what happened. It would have been more impressive if Jesus had looked up to heaven and said, I'm ready, Father. And fishes and loaves would have rained from the sky. But that's not what happened. What happened is that Jesus gave thanks and he gave the food to his disciples. Remember, he told them, you would be the ones to feed them. And the disciples gave that food to the 10, 15,000 people. How much food was there? Matthew says, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. May not look like much of a miracle, but it was one. From five loaves and two fishes to feeding 15,000 people and 12 basketfuls of leftovers. By the way, one for each of the disciples. It was a miracle. And Matthew focuses on the greatness of the miracle when he says, the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. What's going on here? Why does Matthew take the time to tell us all of these details? That it comes through the disciples. That everybody was satisfied and that there were even leftovers. Well, all of these little details remind us of Christ's almighty power. Friends, I think there are at least three important lessons for us to learn from this miracle. Three applications that we can take from this text and apply to our own lives. First of all, remember that Jesus' miracle didn't look all that impressive. And the take-home for us is that maybe we need to remember that the way that Christ provides for all our needs is sometimes very ordinary, usually Very ordinary. How does God provide for our needs? Well, he gives us the strength we need to earn a living, to go to work day in and day out, and to honor and serve him in the way that we interact with others, the way we we serve our bosses and our customers and our clients. I know it may not look like much. It doesn't seem to be all that impressive. But that is how God takes care of us, through normal, everyday means, like the ability to work. A second application is to remember that what Jesus provided these people was bread and fish, the staples of the Mediterranean diet. Everybody was satisfied, but this was not a banquet. Okay, they, didn't have, they didn't have quarterhouse steaks and mashed potatoes. The take home for us is to remember that while God does meet all of our needs, he may in his infinite wisdom choose not to meet all of our wants. Let's not confuse the two. Let's not look at the things that we have and then accuse God of not giving us the things that we want. It may very well be in our best interest that God is not giving us the things that we want so that we might stay focused on him as the giver of all good gifts. And one last application. 
one that I think as Lutherans we can't help but notice. Did you notice the language that Matthew uses and how close, how closely it corresponds to the language of the Lord's Supper? I'm going to read these verses again, and I want you to think about the the words of institution that Jesus would speak later at the Lord's Supper. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves, then gave them to the disciples. Those are almost direct quotations, aren't they? Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that the feeding of the 5,000 is the Lord's Supper. First of all, these people ate to their full. They, they were satisfied. There is no mention of wine. And in the Lord's Supper, there's nothing to do with fish. So Matthew 14 is not about the Lord's Supper. But when you and I consider these verbal parallels, when we hear Jesus gave thanks and he broke and he gave, how can we not help but think of this meal that we are about to receive in just a few moments? How can we not think Help but think about what this meal means. The full and free forgiveness of all of our sins, won by Christ's blood on the cross, the blood that we receive. The peace with God that exists because of that body that was hoisted up between heaven and earth for us. How can we not help but remember that this supper is but a foretaste of the heavenly banquet? in which we will have not only everything we need, but everything we want in the glories and splendors of heaven. When our sinful nature is destroyed and we are completely and utterly at peace with God, living with him forever in heaven. As wonderful as it might have been to have been on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and to have had some of that loaves and fish passed to us, I would suggest that we have something far better and far more beautiful. A testimony of why we can rely on God to meet all of our needs. Because he's already provided for our greatest need, the need for forgiveness. Again and again, week in and week out, as we meditate on his word, as we hear it proclaimed, and as we receive his body and blood. Brothers and sisters, when I first heard, when I first looked up the sermon passage for this week and I saw it was the feeding of the 5,000, there was a part of me that said, what new am I going to say about that? And I wonder if when you heard the lesson, the feeding of the 5,000, if you didn't think, oh, what new is he going to say about that? But it's a beautiful miracle, isn't it? A beautiful miracle that shows us the heart of God, the compassion of God, that he looks upon us and he sees us in our need and he acts, he does something about it. That's the kind of God, that's the kind of Savior we have. But not only do we have a God who loves us, a God who is compassionate and loving, but we have a God who is powerful, a God who can turn five loaves and two fish into enough food to feed 10 or 15,000 people. A God so powerful that he could find a way to forgive your sins and mine. A God so powerful that he conveys that forgiveness through bread and wine in his supper. A God so powerful that he will rescue us from this present evil age to live with him in perfect peace and glory forever in the age to come. This is the God we have. This is the God proclaimed by the feeding of the 5,000. My friends, trust him. Rely on him. Because he promises he will meet all your needs. Amen. Amen.